Right, I'm just going to make sure we're actually live here, so I'm not just rambling to myself for the next hour. So if you're joining live, please give me a very brief moment to make sure we're on. Let's see here. There I am. I can see my handsome and very modest, <laughs> humble face. There I am. Okay, let's do this. Buckle up, folks. Strap in, because this is going to be comprehensive. I'm just going to hit you with good info today. The goal of today's training get you up and running, arm you with everything you need to know to start losing weight with this incredible approach to nutrition that has single-handedly, single-handedly, excuse me, changed my life. It really has. I can't put everything on the nutrition side of it. There's many things, many variables, excuse me, that are going to dictate whether you get a slim and healthy body. But undoubtedly, the nutrition is a massive aspect. And as I say, plant-based diet has uh, certainly changed my life. That's for absolute certain. I'm going to break down this live stream into five separate categories. Number one is the food. Number two, supplements. Number three, we're going to cover training. Number four, we're going to cover progress measurement. Really important. Boring topic, boring sounding topic, but so crucial to your success. So hang on with me throughout this. Don't just listen to the food and then disappear. Plenty of actionable stuff, plenty of nuggets as we go. And finally, number five, this is a big one as well, mindset and lifestyle. So let's dive in. None of this chit chat today. Let's get straight into this. Let's talk about the food. I'm going to lay out my meal plan for you. Before we do that, though, important question that I often get asked is how many times per day should you eat? How often should you eat? Frankly, folks, this is preference. OK, what matters for weight loss is your being in a calorie deficit. That's all. That's all that matters for weight loss. That is the bottom line. People don't like talking about calories. When I start talking about calories, people are like, especially in the vegan plant based community, they're like, no, I thought it was just about eating plants. I think I thought I didn't have to worry about calories. Of course you do. Right. They're a really valuable metric. It's not to say that weight loss is totally dictated by calories and nothing else matters because we know that's not true either. Hormones, metabolism so on and so forth. We know that it does go beyond calories, but undoubtedly they're an invaluable metric. And so whether you eat five meals a day or three meals a day, frankly, in the uh, least harsh sounding way, I actually don't care. Respectfully, I don't care. It's simply preference. If there's an obvious answer to the question for you, go with that. Just ensure that every day you're in a calorie deficit. That said, what I have all of my vegan slim and sustain students do is the typical, and it is very typical, three meal and one snack formula. That's the formula that seems to work very well for the vast majority of people. That's what I do to this day. Sometimes I'll have two snacks, but more or less every day for me for the last seven Seven years has been three meals and one snack. Years and years ago, before I went vegan plant based, I uh, I was into intermittent fasting. I tried there, I tried everything. You guys know my story. I tried so much. I tried intermittent fasting, that sort of thing. And I've accidentally intermittent fasted sometimes. Sometimes I'll wake up, I just get to work, and all of a sudden it's one p.m. and I think, oh, I haven't I haven't even eaten yet today. I best eat something. Best get some nutrition in. But it really is down to preference. So you choose. So long as you're in a calorie deficit, it absolutely does not matter. People overanalyze this stuff. They really do. Look, we're going to get into our meal plan in just a second. Let me just read some of your comments, people coming in. Hi, Ryan from New York. Hello, welcome. Brenda, regular here. Hi, Brenda, how are you doing? Another Ryan here. Hi, Ryan. Thank you all for joining, whether live or on the replay. I appreciate you being here, and hopefully you're going to get lots of use out of this. Now, I'm on StreamYard, so I've got my fancy graphics. So give me a second here, because we're going to start with breakfast, some breakfast options. My uh, lovely head is about to vanish for about 10 and a half seconds whilst I pull up a little infographic. Get ready to screenshot or take notes, folks, because this is good stuff coming now. So there you can see my fingers. My little pasty, pasty uh, white limbs in this British weather, <laughs> this uh, uh, sun lacking British weather. Easy plant based breakfast here. People love the oatmeal there going from left to right. Uh, fruit or veg smoothie can be a great way to start the day. You just got to make sure with smoothies that you're actually bulking them up enough. A lot of people say, oh, I don't really get full on a smoothie. It's because you're hardly putting anything in it. And um, you've got to have some calorie density in there. So maybe some oats, maybe some nut butter, maybe some flaxseed just to bulk it up in terms of calories a little bit. Potato hash is a popular one among, amongst my clients. You guys know bottom left here, I love those healthy cereal bowls, the bran flakes, the muesli, et cetera. Great way to start the day. Bit of fruit, bit of plant milk, whole wheat toast with avocado. Yes, avocado, absolutely fine to eat and still lose weight. A lot of misconceptions about those more fat-rich plant foods. We'll come on to those throughout this, this live stream. We'll address some of those misconceptions and myths as we go. But avocado, Avocado toast, brilliant. Nut butter on toast. Yeah, okay, nut butter, bit risky again, isn't it, from uh, 
from a fat loss perspective. But yeah, you can have a bit of nut butter, of course, and still lose weight at the same time. So nut butter toast for breakfast as well. I love those cereal bowls. You guys know if you've been following me for a while, I've been eating these cereal bowls for three years. When I first went vegan, I pretty much had oatmeal every breakfast for about three years. I got so sick of it, even if I varied up the fruit on top, the berries, the toppings, so on and so forth, put cacao nibs in, you know, to make it a little bit different, whatever I did, I eventually got bored. Now I'm on the cereal bowls. I'm sure in a year's time, I'll be back on the oatmeal. It's just how it goes, right? I'm pretty repetitive and that helps because it means I can keep things simple. Uh, but for me, it's the cereal bowls. But again, this is down to preference. These are all clean, low calorie density overall, you know, um, excuse me, volume of steel, so low caloric density, but decent, generous portions um, because you're using lots of low caloric density foods, lots of berries on there as well to really bulk it up. Um, you know, nutritionally rich, you know, these are all brilliant in their own right. So again, this is a preference thing, but hopefully you've got some options there. Lunch for us, where's my next graphic here? Bear with me, folks, getting used to all this software again, having a live stream for a little while. Where are my lunch options? I don't think I have an infographic for lunch. Oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Here it is. The sacred Ryan Adams sandwich. Whether it's beetroot hummus or regular hummus, this is a classic. So screenshot this one, folks. Take a photo of this, whatever you need to do. If you're watching on uh, your desktop, you just take a photo of it on your phone or screenshot, whatever. Or just make a note of it. But this is what I would say, eight uh, out of 10 of my vegan Slim and Sustained students, this is what they have every lunchtime. Either an avocado sandwich or a hummus sandwich or a sort of a no tuna style sort of chickpea salad sandwich. These are amazing because they're convenient. And I think so often people are trying to make the most elaborate stuff possible. I don't know where this comes from, but people try and make this really elaborate stuff. I suppose they're getting it from the vegan cookbooks, which are in many cases themselves contain very, very elaborate recipes. So my permission today, if I'm in a position to give it to you, my permission help you keep it simple. I want I encourage you to just keep things really simple. And sandwich is such a great option because whether you're going, headed to school, headed out to do some stuff in, in your local city town, whatever, whether you're going to work, I just think it's great. Even if you're at home, right? Even if you could cook at home, but you're looking after the kids or something like that, sandwich is great because you just assemble it in a couple of minutes. Bam, done. Easy. Um, and so I love that as an option. And yes, bread, despite misconceptions, can be amazing for um, a healthy and slim body. Of course, it can be weight loss friendly. Of course, it can. It just depends what it contains. So you're looking for maybe a whole wheat, rye, sourdough is not too bad. One of those breads, you know, high fiber as possible and limiting the nasties. So the eggs, the oil, dairy, excuse me, so on and so forth, and preferably not made out of so much white flour. And that's going to be weight loss friendly bread. Of course, it's all relative. So when people ask me, Ryan, is bread okay for weight loss? On paper, my answer is yes, but there's a sort of an asterisk on the end there because the caveat is it depends what kind of bread, what you use it with, how much you eat. It depends what the rest of your diet looks like. You could have a really unhealthy bread. You could have a couple of slices of really unhealthy bread. You could lather it in something like Nutella. That's obviously not going to be helpful for weight loss, right? But you might just have two or three slices of that. And then the rest of your day is appropriate in terms of your overall caloric requirements. That's not to say I'm encouraging you or giving you blessing to eat loads of white bread and Nutella. I'm just saying it's all contextual. It's all relative. So is bread okay for weight loss? Yeah, absolutely. When you make the right choices. And that's what my clients do. That's what we ensure they do. So other lunch options, just to give you some sense of variety, you could just do the, the classic sort of three ingredient dish. So you could do whole grain, a bean or a lentil of some kind, and just some veggies there. This stuff is simple, maybe a bit of hummus on the side, a bit of salsa, a bit of hot sauce, whatever you like to give it a little bit of flavor. Um, burrito bowls, that's what a lot of my clients love. Soups are really good, especially this time of year. Soups, an amazing food for weight loss as well, by the way. You just got to make sure that what's in the soup is actually hearty enough to keep you full beyond just an hour or two. Because that's the problem with soup, right? So many vegetables and it's so water diluted that you get all this volume and you get this initial sort of fullness from it. Have you actually consumed that many calories to actually feel fueled? It's great from a micronutrient perspective, soup is amazing in terms of vitamins and minerals, but calorically, are you at risk of under eating if you're always having soup all the time? Potentially. So those are some lunches. Let's get on to the dinners though. This is where people trip up, right? We can all be motivated for breakfast and lunch. It's fine. But we get a little bit stressed or three to 4 p.m. rolls around a bit later in the day, you know, or you get home, you're like, oh, it's Netflix hour. That's when people have all of these associations and habits built around food. That's when people can turn to food emotionally to, uh, to help them decompress or in a futile attempt, perhaps to help them decompress, de-stress, whatever it is. Um, but anyway, let's cut to the chase here. Dinners. Uh, spaghetti with lentil marinara, starting at the top here. Number one, really popular option. Quick stir fry with frozen mixed veggies. This is number two now. 
now tofu or edamame, rice and soy sauce. This actually, the, the tofu stir fry is actually something that a lot of my clients do as a bit of a, it's a bit of a winner. It's a bit of a home run uh, for many of my clients. A great evening meal because it's so quick to prepare. Tofu, it's nutritionally diverse as well because you've got all those different veggies in the stir fry. You've got the tofu, you've got the rice. It's a tasty dish, you know, and something that you can do in, in you know, 10 to 15 minutes at most with very minimum preparation, minimal preparation, excuse me. Black bean tacos, another option number three, loaded sweet potatoes. I like just taking, it doesn't even have to be sweet potato, potato, white potato, baking it, or you can do the sort of cheat code where you do it in the microwave. Let me bring my head on the screen, excuse me, very quickly. We'll come back to it in just a second if you haven't had a chance to take a photo of yet, rest assured. Um, yeah, you can do your frozen. Obviously, potatoes are better baked in the oven. Of course, they are. I can't deny that. But cheat code, do them in the microwave. Just stab them with a fork a couple of times on either side. And they need maybe, depending on the size of potato, eight, seven to eight minutes either side. They don't taste as good. I can't BS you guys. They don't taste as good. But wow, when you're in a pinch, um, time-wise really great option. So yeah, potatoes, adding some beans, maybe a little bit of tahini to that, or a simple Buddha bowl, burrito bowl I mentioned earlier. These are really quick and easy dinner options. There's a theme here. If you're new to me, if you've been watching me, if you're an OG subscriber, you know this already. If you're a longer term viewer, you know this already. But there's a theme here for the newcomers. My stuff is simple, right? We want to strike the balance between having simple meals, but also getting good diversity and richness in terms of vitamins and minerals, in terms of nutrients. And I think the more simplistic you are with your nutrition, the more you're at risk of compromising, have a, having a nice sort of diverse and varied diet in terms of, you know, the nutrient intake. So you don't want to be so simple that you're always relying on mono meals. And that's ultimately, even though I think there are good lessons to be learned from hearing people's testimonials about doing, you know, a potato diet or reset or something like that. I think there's, or the rice diet, for example, I think there's merit to those things. I'm not totally writing them off, but I, I think it's definitely better, you know, to have a more macro and micronutriently, nutritionally, excuse me, balanced diet by having, you know, a couple of ingredients, at least in a meal, because they all can play a different role in terms of giving you enough carbs, fat and protein. And then in terms of a vitamin and mineral profile, enough, whatever it is, but potassium, magnesium, vitamin C, vitamin B, blah, 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 blah so on and so forth. Okay. And variety is going to allow you to do that. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's a sliding scale, right? It's spectrum. At the other end is, you know, being really elaborate, you know, having an extensive grocery list because you're trying to tick every different thing off the list and, and being incredibly Puritan with your, with the sort of rotation of, of the vegetables, of the whole grains, of the, the different food groups that you're using. And I just think at some point, do you compromise practicality? The obvious answer is yes, of course. So the theme with my stuff is that it's an, it, I don't always do it perfectly myself, but I'm trying to keep things simple for my clients. I'm trying to keep things simple from, forget my clients, for myself, right? In the first place, when I started this, I really wanted to keep things simple because I was busy. I knew that that was going to be key to my success. So lots of dinner options there for you. Snacks, snacky, snacky snacks. Let's see where... Uh, are the, where's a little snack infographic? I've got one here. I like fruit and that's what many of my clients do, but let me give you a bunch of variety. So again, once more, I think this is the last time I promise, get ready to screenshot, take photos. I'm going to disappear. Here's some good snacks for you. So fruit, nuts and seeds, obviously nuts and seeds, high risk because of caloric density, popcorn. A lot of people worried about popcorn. Depends if it's got loads of oil, of course, butter is not vegan. So I don't um, advise, advocate um but popcorn yeah you can do air pop popcorn very very cleanly couple of cups and you've not actually even consumed you know 100 120 calories so for most of my slim and sustained students this is absolutely fine as a snack trail mix again caloric density this is all relative like some of these snacks will be more or less appropriate for you personally depending on what your goals are depending on what the rest of your diet looks like i'm going to keep adding that caveat in throughout because sometimes people will watch these videos and they'll say well ryan mentioned trail mix as a snack so that that means I can have trail mix as a snack every day. That's not necessarily what I'm saying, right? For that level of customization and personalization, ultimately, you're going to have to work with me like I can, or I'm going to have to know to advise you a little bit better, maybe on Instagram, if we're having a bit of a conversation, I'm just giving you a bit of a free advice. Um, so yeah, it's this is generalist, of course, so I'm broadly speaking here. So there's always caveats. Roasted beans, uh, such as chickpeas, we're now on the middle column, middle row, excuse me here. Hummus and veggies. Um, Dates and nut butter or energy balls just down below. Banana and ice cream, that's another popular one. Bit of work, but that's another popular one. Rice cakes and peanut butter, you can simultaneously do um, rice cake, or adversely, I should say, rice cakes and, and hummus and maybe some cucumber or radish slices or 
tomato, guacamole and crackers. You can get clean crackers, kale chips done, baked nicely in the oven. Lots of good snack options. Where am I at with snacking? I don't hold some sort of binary or maybe arbitrary is the better word view that snacking you know, is something that's terrible for you. Again, it's contextual. It depends what. It depends how often. I think some people do get caught in that sort of grazing, I call it paradigm, where they're just constantly nibbling on something out of boredom or constantly going, you know, they do a bit of work. Everyone's working from home nowadays. And then within half an hour, they're in the fridge rummaging around. They're not necessarily eating anything, but they're looking around. They might pick a couple of things. Or they're not eating a full meal, but they might start picking up things. This is a, this grazing paradigm, I, I'm always very, very conscious of. Um, or if I were you and I was trying to lose weight, I'd be very conscious of. If you've been a big grazer in the past, it's amazing. What you think is an innocent habit can actually contribute by the end of the day an extra 200 calories to your diet. Doesn't sound like a startling amount, but let me tell you, weight loss is a game of fine margins. And for a lot of you, 200 calories could make the world of difference when it comes to actually slimming down and getting that scale moving. So yeah, I'm not, like I say, I'm not automatically opposed to snacking, but I do have a wariness around it. I think, again, if you are genuinely hungry, if you genuinely feel you need that fuel, and that's a level of intuition that obviously takes months and years to develop. So you might be thinking, well, how do I even work that out? Well, that's more of an advanced stage. But if you can genuinely justify eating that thing and it's not coming from a place of emotional hunger or craving or boredom or stress or response to an emotion, then it's probably coming from a good place. And there probably is a, a genuine case that you need, quote unquote, that food. Does that make sense? Um, oh, I forgot. Uh should I do this now? I'm really compromising my running order here, but get ready to screenshot this, folks. This is my easy hummus recipe. This is exactly the recipe that I have my clients do. Um, so yeah, screenshot that if you want my hummus recipe. And there's also a creamy beet recipe as well there. You basically take my hummus and throw in a cooked beet. <laughs> that's, the, that's the difference. doesn't really need to be re uh, uh, an infographic, does it? It's pretty uh, self-explanatory, I suppose. So that's the meal plan. Three meals and one snack. Before we move on, let me just get to, I can see some comments coming in. It's noon here in New York. Yeah, I'm so used to talking to my clients across the pond that even though I know it's late in the day for me, I'm conscious of <laughs> the three time zones across the US or the three main time zones, I should say, across the US as well. Uh, Ryan says, I cannot do screenshots right now here, but we'll rewatch later. No worries, Ryan. You could do them on your phone. Oh, I guess you're watching it on your phone. And da -da -da, or you can take notes. Yeah. Happy fry. Yay. Oh, no. Oh, that's a cringy one, isn't it? Yeah. No, but uh, seriously, jokes aside, happy Friday to you. Good morning from Orange County. Good morning from Hungary. We got you guys worldwide. It's lovely to see you all here. Thank you for your time today. So that's the meal plan part. If you are just joining now, go back five, 10 minutes, get the whole meal plan here. Let's talk about macronutrients very quickly. I don't like to get lost in some of these details too much because again, this um, live stream is designed with mostly with beginners and intermediates in, in mind. And I'm always wary with beginners and intermediates, not to sound condescending, not to sound like I'm thinking of you guys, like you are so unintelligent that you can't process all the information I'm giving to you. That isn't how I feel at all. But I am conscious of overwhelming people that are just getting started with information that actually matters versus information that slightly matters. And so what I'm about to say, important disclaimer, the information I'm about to share with you only slightly matters. And it only slight, it's actually very important, but it only slightly matters in this context because I've already given you meal ideas that uh, I'll explain it to you. Macro balance, balance, ideal macronutrients for health and weight loss. This is the conclusion I've come to. Generally speaking, a high carbohydrate diet, moderate protein and low-ish fat. And I stress ish on the low-ish there, low-ish fat. That is not the same as, a, as, a, as avoiding fat-rich plant foods altogether. I said I'd talk about this 10 minutes ago. So nuts, seeds, avocados. I want to be very clear here. I like the starch solution. I agree with many other plant-based doctors uh, on, generally speaking, a low-fat methodology. But I do not agree with an ultra-low-fat methodology. Ultra-low-fat, by my definition, is below 10% of calories. I don't agree with that. I think the 15 to 20% range, 15 to 20% of your overall daily calories, roughly speaking, you don't need to be precise with this stuff every day, coming from fat, um, I think is, is wise hormonally in terms of the nutrients that fat rich plant foods provide that you can't get elsewhere or will struggle rather to get elsewhere. I think it's really important that you have some overt, some fat rich plant foods in your diet. But of course, the argument that you need to be cautious and mindful with those because of their caloric density, because of fats, you know, the, the way that the metabolic efficiency associated with fat rich foods. Absolutely. 
absolutely there should be a mindfulness and a cautiousness around it. You can't be as liberal with avocado as you could with broccoli. That's quite obvious. Um, so that's the ideal macronutrient breakdown. But I want to stress what I stressed right at the start of this before we even got into the meal plan. Calories are going to dictate the bottom line here. Macronutrients are important, but you can have a great macronutrient profile. If you're overeating on a calorie front, you ain't going to be losing much weight. You're not. So get the calories right first, obviously. Portion sizes then. Um, I sort of alluded to this again when I talked about calories at the start. Portions, this sounds so funny. Portion sizes are actually not the main concern. I feel in the mainstream weight loss world, people are constantly talking about portions, eat less food, do more exercise, move more. That's kind of the mantra, isn't it, in the mainstream weight loss world? And, you know, as a basic premise, I can't fault that. That makes sense. But there's, of course, nuance to that, right? And there's there are exceptions to that. When you eat a low caloric diet, a low calorie density, excuse me, diet with lots of foods like these plant foods, the fruits, the veggies, the whole grains, the tubers, there are always exceptions. Nuts and seeds are the exception in this case in terms of calories. This is generally speaking a very low caloric density diet. In other words, the sorts of meals I've run you through the last 10 minutes or so, these are meals that actually don't contain that many calories, but are very generous in portion size. And meaning by caloric density, what I mean by a food having a low caloric density is it's low in calories for the volume that it actually provides. And there's no better example of this than, than vegetables and fresh fruits. Dried fruits are an exception, but fresh fruits. These are the, the amount of volume you can get, the amount of strawberries you can eat, and you've only consumed 33 calories. It would absolutely blow your mind. In fact, I may even have a graphic on that to illustrate. Do I have a graphic on this? Mm, maybe not. That would be cool if I did, wouldn't it? Uh... I do have one somewhere, but not here, ready to go, I'm afraid. Um, so, yeah. Um, and so I think with portion sizes, it's not to say they don't matter. It's just to say when you're eating a low calorie density diet, you have to pay. You don't have to pay as much attention to them anyway. And you can eat generous portions and still, you know, be in a sensible calorie deficit without too much concern about, oh, am I eating too much? Now, you want to be concerned about, are you eating too many calories? But calories and portions are not always the same thing. That's the distinction. Does that make sense? And the great thing about this is you can eat till you're full because these are so self-limiting. These foods, in terms of one, caloric density, but two, their um, nutrient profile, these foods are so self-limiting. And it makes it harder. It's not impossible, but it makes it harder to overeat with a plant-based diet. On the flip side, the amount of people that come to me say, Ryan, I'm eating plants, but not losing weight. And then I, you know, I sort of ask them a bit more about their diet. And it turns out they're eating 3000 calories a day as a five foot five woman. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. This is kind of obvious whether, and you're only doing a bit of exercise. It's kind of obvious where this is likely going wrong, right? So calories and portions, they still absolutely matter. The good thing is, when you follow the tenets of whole foods, plant-based eating, you don't have to be as mindful. And that's really nice and stress relieving. As with my clients, they don't have to count a single calorie. But the reason why is because we're using volume eating principles, number one, but I'm also building them a meal plan where I've thought about calories and macronutrients for them. So it takes away the guesswork for them. So they're just told exactly how much to eat, what to eat, so on and so forth. So that burden, that stress of sort of, am I eating too much food? Am I eating too many calories? It's lifted off their shoulders because I've already calculated it for them. Does that make sense? We've talked about the fat content content already. But one thing I didn't mention, I forgot to mention was the importance of uh, those seeds, the big three seeds, flax, hemp, or chia seeds. I'd also throw walnuts in this category being high in omega threes as well. I think these are really, really healthy, really, really important for you and some of the best foods in terms of nutrient profile on the planet. So I would recommend daily some of your fat source coming from hemp, as I say, flax, chia seed, or wool nuts. We're sticking mostly to whole foods. This should be obvious. I've talked about the importance of being in a calorie deficit throughout, and you can be in a calorie deficit eating Pop-Tarts. You can do that. You will lose weight. However, it's, of course, not my suggestion, because it isn't just about calories, hormones, metabolism, gut bacteria, so on and so forth. All of these things will play a role in weight loss as well. But more widely than weight loss, I always think, don't you want to actually get healthy too? Okay, you can lose some weight, but don't you want to lower that cholesterol? Don't you want to have um, amazing blood work the next time you go to the doctors? Don't you want a, your best shot at preventing major chronic disease? That's what I always think. And that was funny because I even remember thinking that at 21 years old, which is sort of unusual to think at 21 years old. But I tried so many of those other ridiculous and aggressive efforts and attempts to lose weight. I tried the flexible dieting where I was frankly eating a bunch of rubbish. And I still would have periods where I'd lose a couple of pounds, but it was unsustainable. And now I look back at all those things and I remember I got so sick of it at 21. I was like, 
I actually want to do something more holistic here, more natural. And that's obviously when I became open to the idea of, of moving in a, a more plant-based direction and ultimately went vegan in the summer of 2015. So I always think, yeah, losing weight's cool, but it's also amazing to get healthy at the same time too, hey, win-win. And so we're sticking mostly to those whole foods. That's not to say you can't have the occasional vegan burger, bit of ice cream, a G&T when you're out on a, a date with a with your other half, with your partner, with your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Um you know, glass of wine every now and again with your friends, like that's, that is okay. And you will still get great results overall, but we're sticking mostly to whole foods for optimal results, quite obviously. I think a good rule as well, even though I haven't really covered it here in the meal plan section is to have a once daily salad. Salads are really, really good. If you get in the habit of saying, okay, with my, you can just do it with lunch. You just make a little bowl of salad on the side, really good way. Those leafy greens, because I haven't mentioned them, they deserve a special shout out. Um, so yeah, once daily salad is a great habit to get into meals out like i said earlier you know it's okay you can do it every now and again and still get great weight loss results but you might need to set a rule for yourself what i say to my clients is start out with no more than one meal a week treat it like an allowance or a token that you get to spend but once it's gone it's gone and you can't use it again in that seven day period so monday through sunday you get one meal out per week if you use it on monday night you're in trouble you got nothing else for the rest of the week and i think you know you can still you to be fair you can eat out and make good choices that might be very compliant with your at home meal plan for example so this is, again, this is just a rule of thumb. There are exceptions to this. And you could still lose weight eating out twice a week so long as the choices aren't that terrible. However, I think people need rules and they need frameworks to actually guide their behavior by and they need some kind of strictness. So maybe for you, the best thing right now, if you're a serial um, takeout, you know, indulger, serial eater, outer, eating outer, um, then it might be, you can tell I've spent far too much time talking to clients and whatnot today to do this live stream, really, or getting this all messed up. But yeah, if you're a big eating out person, yeah, you might need to set a very clear and hard and fast rule for yourself. What do I think about faux meats, cheeses, etc., those vegan alternatives? Generally, to be honest, to, to shoot straight from the hip, most of them are pure junk. Can't beat around the bush. Most of them are pure junk, in my opinion. Again, I don't want to have to keep saying this. I get sick of my own sayings, but there are exceptions to the rule, okay? The sweet potato and butternut squash and black bean burger that I could maybe find in Tesco's down the road, that is a damn sight cleaner, quote unquote, and therefore more health and weight loss friendly than an impossible burger, right? So of course there are exceptions, but generally those very heavily processed, you know, so faux meats, cheeses, etc., pure junk. And I think the overconsumption of them by vegans actually only gives plant-based eating and veganism a worse name. I really do. I think that stuff is, uh, is not good for you. And I don't think it promotes quite the right image. And um, so full transparency, I occasionally have these things but they're not a large part of my diet. And the more I have those things, the less I want them. I'm like, oh, I don't like this stuff anymore. Because you just get used to feeling really good and eating foods. You just get used to what you're eating, right? So I really now enjoy sitting down for a rice and beans bowl and some veggies. Like I really enjoy that. And I actually will enjoy that more than a burger. I will. After maybe the first bite of a vegan burger, it's boring after that, right? I want the stuff I'm used to. You can really train yourself to like new foods. But anyway, we're going into separate tips. I've already sort of uh, given you this battle cry, beat the drum about simplicity, but hopefully you can see, you know, with the with the meal plan I gave you, you know, towards the start of this live stream, keeping things simple is, is something I can't speak of. Uh, you know, highly enough. Um, that's what my best clients do. And that's a mantra of my program. And uh, I've had people apply to my coaching program before. And when we're discussing things, because I screen everyone that comes on the Vegan Slim and Sustain program, when we're discussing things, they're telling me how they're a big foodie and they like to have all these different ingredients. And here are my favorite recipes from this vegan cookbook. And I'll politely and respectfully say, look, I think you're going to be bored on my meal plan. I think it's going to be too repetitive for you. I have a simplistic approach because that seems to work. And um, yeah, uh, I will politely and respectfully turn people away because I feel that they have more elaborate needs or I don't know if it's needs or wants, but needs or wants for their food. And so simplicity is, is a huge theme uh, in what I teach. It's one of the three S's. I'm always going on to my clients about these three S's. Um, simplicity is number one. Structure and sustainability, they're the other two S's. And these are really, really integral parts of, of my philosophy to this day. Alcohol, I sort of touched it briefly there when I talked about wine and G&Ts. Alcohol's terrible for you. <laughs> like, again, I can't sort of be diplomatic about this in good conscience. Alcohol is terrible for you. Avoid it at all costs. Again, full transparency, I probably have alcohol once, maybe a month, twice a month at a push. Not a huge amount. Not for someone of my age, not for a British person of my, person of my age. Um, but 
But no, I've gone in my adult life. I've gone after university, at least. I used to knock it back in uni, let me tell you. But after university, at least, I've gone six months, best part of a year with, without touching Bruce before. I've done that very easily. Nowadays, it may be, you know, I might not touch it for two months. And then I might have it once a week for a couple of weeks. And then I'll be like, oh, I don't know. This doesn't do anything for me. So, yeah, I have to be transparent with you guys. But alcohol is terrible. I don't advertise that. Um, it's terrible. Um, but again, a little glass of wine every now and again. G-A-T, G&T, excuse me. It's not going to ruin your results. Water. This is really important, often overlooked. Um, I have a lot of people come to me and um, yeah, they're, they're drinking like 36 ounces of water a day, which is like it's about a litre for anyone that goes by metric. So it's, yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible. People are generally speaking in the Western world, extremely dehydrated, I believe. I've not seen studies on this, but anecdotally from conversations I have, people are extremely dehydrated. Um, and so you want to be shooting as an adult for at least two liters, if not considerably more, a good bit more, maybe upside of three, but certainly two liters, um, which is about, what's that? 70 to 80 ounces, I believe. Um, and yeah, get that water in, really important, especially because you're having a higher fiber diet now as well to push that fiber through the system. Water, being hydrated is crucial anyway, obviously, for so many functions. But um, certainly if you've got a higher fiber diet, which I would like you to have, I encourage you to have, really crucial. And that's the nutrition component. For anyone watching live, I may have a bit of time at the end to get to your questions, so stick them in the comment section down below. Uh, there might be more, I might have missed some. Um, oh yeah, I have, here's a good question whilst we're on the nutrition. What about salt? Little bit of salt is okay. Little bit of salt is okay, not too bad. I'm not one of these SOS free types. Oil is terrible for you. Don't get me wrong, oil is terrible, I'm on board with that. But a little bit of salt, and even a tiny bit of like brown sugar on the oatmeal, for example, Half a teaspoon brown sugar on the oatmeal, a little bit of maple syrup. I'm absolutely okay with that. To make healthy food taste good, I think that's a, a sacrifice that I'm willing to make and my clients are willing to make. So yeah, those are my views on salt. A little bit is okay, but I, you know, I don't see that it's necessitous to get rid of it entirely. I'm I don't believe in the full SOS sort of free methodology. So that's the nutrition component. As I say, if you're watching live, drop your comments in the live chat um, to the I think it's on the right hand side of the screen. Let's do supplements very quickly here. There's three things that I consider as being mandatory to supplement as a vegan or plant-based diet. Dietary, excuse me. Worth adding as a bit of a caveat here. I would recommend some of these things to meat eaters too. So it's worth just saying, but I don't help meat eaters, right? I help you guys. B12, vitamin D, and uh, DHA, DHA, excuse me, an EPA supplement. So omega-3 for short, but DHA. Um, from algae from algae. I really want to stress from algae. That's really important. I've talked about ALA conversion, the uh, inefficiency with that. I've talked about that previously. Let's not open that can of worms here. Then it gets really advanced, right? We want to keep this stuff, again, not sound patronizing, but people are beginners coming to this video. Let's keep it really simple. Um, so B12, once more, vitamin D and an omega-3 supplement. Now there's a case for calcium, for zinc, for iodine, as there, any, as there is, excuse me, for omnivorous folks. There is a case for supplementing other things. Um, however, these are generally speaking, not things that I view as being mandatory. So I've given you the things that I think are mandatory across the board for all vegans and plant-based dieters, B12, once more, vitamin D and omega-3. There is then a secondary category, like I say, calcium, iodine, iron, zinc, um, K2, um, that ideally you should get vitamin D, uh, fortified mixed with K2 as well, but okay, again, can of worms, um, so yeah, these things, these things, there are, there are some people that would be benefited by, you know, supplementing these daily as well, the secondary list daily as well. But uh, I think generally speaking, most people aren't going to need to supplement these things. What do I think about protein powder whilst we're on supplements to round off this section? Um, I think that protein powder is, is just because it's a processed food, that doesn't mean it's terrible for you. Again, lots of messaging in the whole foods plant-based community that says anything processed, steer away from it. I don't agree with this. It's all a spectrum, right? You can find processed foods that are still high in fiber, maintain a great nutrient profile, therefore very, very good for you. Okay, they're more processed than if they're in their whole food form, obviously, because they're a processed food. I like this idea that Dr. Greger talks about. He refers to them as, as intact plant foods. And I like that um, because there is sort of nuance there. There are some processed foods that, oh, they've got the word processed food in. So for people, it sort of evokes, oh, that's been messed around with. That's artificial. It's like, meh, everything. So now we're going to say, even though I've got a holistic approach, I would never sit here and say, Everything that's artificial is bad for you. In the same way, even though I have a very holistic approach when it comes to sort of medicine, I would never say, oh, everything that's man-made 
right? That's automatically terrible for you. It's not that straightforward. It's not that binary. It's not that black and white. So protein powder, where am I at with that? You can get some clean protein powder. That's where I'm going with that whole spiel about um, processed foods or healthier processed foods. You can get some healthy protein powder. It's a spectrum, right? Like I talked about with the cereal, like I talked about with the bread. There's some that are worse than others. And so, yeah, there's plenty of junk sort of whey. You know, you don't want whey, obviously dairy, um, and especially the whey part component of it. Terrible for you. Absolutely terrible for you, in my opinion. Um, but you can get some pretty clean sort of pea protein, isolate, soy protein powder. You know, these are, these can be relatively clean. Sun Warrior have pretty decent blends. But as to whether they're necessary or not, no, of course, they're not necessary, especially for those in my audience. If you're looking to bulk up, it can be a good way to get 20, 25 grams of protein to have a protein shake. That can be really helpful. I mean, you could do it from Whole Foods you know, ideally, that would be ideal. But it can be just a, a nice on the go thing. But most people in my audience, I haven't got the fitness freaks here. I haven't got the gym bros here. That's not why I do. You can tell by my physique, right? I'm not that guy. I used to be into all that. I'm not that guy. I want that lean, slim look. That's what I'm going for. And that's who I attract quite obviously in my audience. So excuse me. So yeah, protein powder is okay. A clean one, but not necessary but I'm not automatically against them. Ryan asks, uh, does unsweet teas count towards water? Yeah, people ask this. And sorry, I don't mean to laugh at you, Ryan. It's just, I just don't understand the thinking behind this. Of course, it's still water. It's still water. Will you find it as hydrating as just drinking plain water? That could be argued, but it's just water. The body's recognizing it as water. So yeah, teas and coffees. I'm not a, a, a massive coffee advocate, admittedly, but teas and coffees, they still count, of course, as water consumption. Absolutely. So that's section number two, supplements here. Let's get on to the exercise. Let's talk about training here. Um, you know, there's so many ways we can go with this. First thing I want to say, if you get your nutrition right, if you're in a calorie deficit, exercise doesn't matter. That's right. I said it. Exercise doesn't matter if you're in a calorie deficit. You could do loads of exercise and still be in a calorie deficit. You could do no exercise, a tiny bit of exercise, a moderate amount of exercise, and you'll still be in a calorie deficit. That's what's going to move the needle for weight loss. So exercise is actually not essential to weight loss. However, that is not me giving you a free pass to sit on the settee and watch Netflix all day so long as you're eating oranges and tofu stir fry, right? That's not what I'm saying. I think beyond the scale exercise is so amazing for you. And it's a massive part of my life. I've always been very candid about the fact from a young age, me and my brother were really encouraged into exercise by our parents. Exercise has never been a problem for me. I've played lots of different sports over the years. You guys now know I love my tennis. I do a little bit of weight training. I love the kickboxing stuff. I'm so into exercise. I do pretty much something every day, right? I, it's actually harder for me to take a rest day now. And that's something that, you know, has been the case for me for a very, very long time. I love exercise. It's always been the food problem for me. That said, I don't actually need to do all this exercise to maintain a slim physique. It's really purely for the enjoyment from it. And also the other health benefits, because this goes beyond the scale as well. I just feel so good when I'm active, when I'm fit, when I've got a little bit of strength, a little bit of physicality about me. I just feel more useful in the world to actually have some, you know, a decent cardio level, decent level of fitness, decent level of strength. I feel more useful. I feel more competent in the world. And I like that feeling. I like that feeling that comes with having a good bit of fitness. So this is why with my clients, even though I get them started with just walking for the first month only, my vegan slim and sustain students, by the month two, by the time month two rolls around, we start doing some very basic home workouts. Month three, we start some light interval training, some light sort of run walk interval training, if you understand what I mean. Just very gentle. We start very gentle. It's designed for beginners. So we start very gently, but we are ultimately building my students up in time. I think that's really, really crucial beyond just the number on the scale. So that's the first thing to say on exercise is you don't actually need loads of exercise to be in a calorie deficit, but I still recommend it anyway. Now, walking is a great place to start. And I think this comes on to a, another theme that I talk about a lot on this subject. Start with low intensity, right? Some people, they're like, ah, oh, I heard that those boot camp style classes, they were great for fat loss, or I know my gym runs spinning classes, or I want to try this orange theory thing. I love your ambition. I respect that. And I think you should ultimately do those things, by the way. But I think if you're a total noob, right, if you're totally new to exercise and you're a very sedentary person right now, is it really sustainable? Is it really practical to sign up to three spinning classes every week at the gym where you know you're going to be burning like five or 600 calories and then you're going to have to deal with the skyrocketing app skyrocketing appetite that comes in and around those bouts of high intensity, high intensity exercise and not knowing how to manage your appetite. That's something that takes time. You have to understand how your body works and trust your judgment. Okay, I can eat a bit more food because I've done lots of exercise lately. This is not beginner stuff. Again, don't want to condescend, but this is not. these are not beginner principles. These are not beginner problems that 
admittedly, if you're new to this, you are in any position to appropriately troubleshoot. So start simple. Start with the low intensity stuff. Start with things you actually know you can stick to. Say to yourself, oh, I'm going to start out with a, there's no harm. There's no shame in just starting out with a 20 minute walk every day. That's great. That's what I have my clients do. 25 minutes, 2,500 steps for the first week. Great way to start. And you can build up to the more um, uh, intense stuff in time as your fitness naturally improves. And that way there isn't such a risk of injury, burnout, boredom, so on and so forth. Like I say, just setting the bar too high. So I think that's a big theme across the board when it comes to nutrition as well. But certainly with exercise, um, set the bar where you're actually at. You know, have the humility to realize where in your fitness and exercise journey you're actually at. And try not to punch above your weight. I don't want people to dream small. I don't. I, it sounds slightly disempowering. That's not the way I mean it. But I do want you to think about what you can actually safely sustain for a long period of time, rather than this just be another sort of aggressive thing that you do and you lose 10 pounds in a couple of weeks, but then February rolls around. You know, I see this every year. Fe it's January at the time of me recording this. February rolls around and yeah, same thing. Oh, no, I'm not doing that anymore. Or, oh, life caught up with me. I got so busy. It's You notice as well with the excuses people give, that's never the reason. Oh, I just got so busy or oh, this came up or so-and-so had their wedding and I just sort of got off track. Da, 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 da. People are full of words, aren't they? Lots of words. Humans say lots of words. I should know, shouldn't I? So that's the exercise. Again, bottom line calorie deficit. So the type of exercise you do, whether it's cardio or strength, the amount you do, it is all preferential. If you want to lose weight, you've got to be in a calorie deficit. But that is not my permission and blessing to sit on the settee, to sit on the sofa all day and do nothing. You should do some exercise regardless of what the scale on the number on the scale is. You should do exercise beyond just losing some weight. Um, progress measurement. Uh, this is the one that I joked about being boring right at the start of the live stream. It is boring, but stick with me because I promise you it's necessitous to your success. Firstly, how many times do I weigh myself, Ryan? This is something I get asked, or how do I track progress? Three weigh-ins a week is all you need. Monday, Wednesday, Friday could be a great thing to do. I have my clients do Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You need multiple weigh-ins and you need continuity with how you take those weigh-ins. So ideally, first thing in the morning, before food or water, after you've visited the bathroom, no clothes on. I know it sounds really pedantic, but this way, if you do that every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the three weigh-ins you choose every week, you're going to get continuity in your weigh-ins. And it sounds like it's ridiculously accurate and ridiculously, like I say, pedantic, but weigh-ins are so unreliable and unpredictable anyway. An individual weigh-in, because it's your body is subject to so many natural fluctuations, not fat gain necessarily or not fat loss, but so many fluctuations anyway. And you, it's so unreliable anyway, so you may as well find as much accuracy in, uh, as you can in the method in which you weigh yourself. Does that make sense? So I'm so particular about how my clients weigh in because weigh-ins are so unreliable. Does that make sense? It makes me even more particular about the process in which they do them because they're unreliable anyway. So three weigh-ins a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and that's going to be enough. You don't need to weigh yourself every day. For some people, that just drives them nuts. Some people have a terrible relationship with the scale. By the way, the solution to the antidote to a terrible relationship with the scale it's not to just hide your scale and say, no, I refuse to weigh in. Right? Every now and again, I have someone write to me say, Ryan, I'd love to join your program, but I'm terrified of the scale and I'm not willing to weigh myself. And I just say to you, this is not the way that a grown adult salt, you know, confronts the problems they have. You can't run away from this. I can understand why stepping on the scale causes emotional problems. It's not pleasant, but you also can't live in denial. You need to face where you're at. And if you're unwilling to actually measure your progress, it'd be like saying, Ryan, I want to um, stop spending so much money, but I refuse to check my bank account. It's like, what? you're asking for something that is clear. You're asking to avoid something that is clearly a rite of passage, <laughs> right? How are you going to know you're losing weight without actually checking your weight? Now, over the long term, you can see it in your physique change, et cetera, et cetera. But you need those short term metrics as well to inform whether your strategy is working or not. Anyway, I'm going on as I so often do. So three weigh-ins a week, continuity around those weigh-ins. Don't weigh yourself every day. Just stick to three. One's not enough. Two's probably not enough. And Three is about the sweet spot, I find. It gives you about enough data to work with without being too much or too overbearing. And um, again, I really stress continuity in how you weigh in. We don't want you weighing one day at the gym at 7 p.m. at night and then the next day on your scales, your bathroom scales at home, uh, you know, 7 a.m. in the morning. Again, not enough continuity. And then this is key as well. Write your numbers down. Some people are like, oh, I'm sure I'm not losing weight. And then I ask them, you know, what, what their numbers are like. And they're like, well, I've been at kind of 86 kilos for a while. And I'm like, yeah, but what do you mean? What do you mean 86 kilos? And they're like, well, 
I don't know where I'm going with this. I've sort of slightly lost my train of thought. Oh, that was it. Yeah. It's like, well, what's, it's like, if you're not writing them down, you don't know. You will not see, oh no, I was actually 85.5 kilos. Then I was actually 85.2. Then I hopped up to 85.8. Now I'm 86.1. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you need to actually track it so you can see what's going on as opposed to saying, well, I've sort of been hovering. It's like, what does that mean? What does hovering mean? How much? How little? When? When were you weighing in? So you actually want to record and write down these three weigh-ins per week so you can actually see the trend of your progress over time. And again, that's going to inform you if you want to keep the same strategy or you need to make some changes because it's not actually working. Um, so that's how you measure. Now, there's other ways to measure progress. I hinted at this. Looking at yourself in the mirror. Before and after photos, I get my clients to do that too. Circumference measurements, the fit of clothes, comments from other people. These are all good bits of feedback that will tell you if this is working or not, if you're losing fat or not. However, I think the scale is still really, really crucial to do as a mandatory because that stuff takes time. That stuff is also unreliable. It's like looking at yourself in the mirror. That's kind of reliant on your subjectivity, the lighting conditions. What if you you might look great in one mirror? In your opinion, you don't think you look as good in another. It's going to be really confusing. So there's something really tangible um, about using something like the scales. So by all means, use these other methods for measuring progress too, but the scales should be your first and foremost. Um, another way to... this, I put this in the progress measurement category. I don't know if it belongs admittedly, but I just want to say a quick word on accountability here. Who is on your team? Most of us in the Western world, we are surrounded by people with terrible food choices. I'll say it like it is. Terrible food choices, lazy people, movie night people. Nothing wrong with a nice movie night. But if you're doing it every every day, it kind of loses. I've always thought people that watch films every day, I'm like, surely at some point, this, you, unless you're a film buff and it's part of your job or something, or you're super passionate about them, like what value does that add to your life? How can movie night be fun if you have movie night every night, right? So I think, um, yeah, most of us, our our initial circle at least is full of lots of people with really bad habits and and we are social creatures and it's not to say that you can't have good habits whilst being surrounded by people with different habits right i'm friends with a lot of people that aren't vegan it doesn't make me not want to be vegan anymore so it's true that you are sort of a product of your environment but that isn't to say you can't have any res resilience to it right or resistance rather to it or any resilience surrounding it. Um, but you, you do want to think carefully about who you're hanging out with and the sorts of habits they're indulging in. And, and does that rub off on you? And if it doesn't, fair enough, great. But many of us, because we're social creatures, because we're influenced, you know, we do tend to capitulate, right? If someone's waving pizza in our face all the time, are we going to do it? So yeah, I don't know that, again, this belongs in the uh, progress measurement category, but really, really important to think about who's on your team. Think about accountability. Think about being around people that can hold your feet to the fire. Is there a, a, a running group that you could join, for instance? Are there any other people that follow a, a health conscious vegan diet that you can meet up with every once a week and talk about how it's going for you what i love there's a couple of clients that in my uh, facebook group there's a slim and sustain uh, facebook group for um, my my students a couple of those folks have, have actually started interacting with each other outside of the group and I love that. And they're being sort of accountability partners for each other. And they have like weekly, as well as having weekly check-ins check -ins with me, they sort of chat every week themselves. Oh, how much weight have you lost week, this week? Is there anything you're struggling with? What do you need help with right now? I just think that's absolutely brilliant, you know, um, to be around people with similar goals to you. Whether they're a couple of steps ahead or not, doesn't really matter or at the same level, doesn't really matter. Just to be around people with similar values, similar goals. I think that's a really important thing for holding your feet to the fire because we are social creatures. And finally here, category number five, as we're getting through this now, almost there, mindset and lifestyle. First thing I want to talk about here is how... Um, hugely overrated motivation is. I talked about this in a recent post in my interview with Tia. You may have seen the, the YouTube short. You may have also seen it on Instagram. Motivation incredibly overrated. It's not to say it's futile. It's clearly a, a spark that lights the engine and ignition, if you will. Um, but it's so feeling-based and therefore very ethereal. It kind of comes and it goes very random. You don't have that much control over it. What you do have control over, though, is your own behavior. And so if you can instill behavioral change, such as, such as habits, excuse me, such as discipline, the repetition that you foster through consistency, um, it, it's amazing how little motivation you actually need anymore. Uh, I have just about the same level of motivation as I did seven years ago, but I'm a lot thinner, fitter, and happier than I was seven years ago. What's that about? 
Well, it certainly wasn't motivation that made the difference. It's that I've trained myself to be a different person. It's that I've adjusted my behavior. Um, and ultimately, that's what's worked over time. And nowadays, I have, as I say, the same level of motivation as I did before, which is every couple of weeks, I have a big you know, release of motivation. I feel really strongly about doing something. And as the days, as the hours, day, week goes on, it slowly dissipates. I don't know how long it usually lasts for. Again, it's a very random thing you don't have that much control over. It's chemical change. And so it slowly dissipates. And then you need, what are you left with? You need something else. You need deep focus, commitment, behavioral change, habits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, I just really want to emphasize how important it is that you capitalize on motivation when it comes, but not wait around for it to strike. Um, and not assume certainly that it's going to be there for the rest of your journey, because it won't. It won't. And this is always prevalent with my clients after the first week, because there's so much excitement, so much enthusiasm when they start the Vegan Slim and Sustain program that naturally sort of wears off. Once they see that it's working, they've lost a couple of pounds. People sort of ease into the program. And that's nice. It's nice. They're relaxing into the program. They're getting good results. It's all good, right? This isn't a problem necessarily. But that sort of newness and novelty and enthusiasm wears off. The motivation dips away a little bit. And that's when we have to work on finding deep commitment helping train the, the new developers and develop, uh, excuse me, habits, develop new habits for the client, you know, creating new patterns of behavior, replacing their old bad ha patterns of behavior and associations in their brain with new ones. This is behavioral change that goes beyond feelings. It goes beyond motivation. Enough on that. Taking ownership and responsibility. What is it, especially about my generation, the entitlement, the lack of responsibility, the finger pointing at so-and-so or so-and-so as, as to the reasons why they're in trouble. If you want to lose weight, you cannot afford to be blaming your partner because they love pizza or wine. Oh, they always want to crack open a bottle of wine with me. You have to take the mantle yourself. You cannot blame the healthcare system. You cannot blame the cultural. Oh, but everyone, the culture, the society we're in, everyone eats rubbish now. It's kind of hard to avoid. Are you, are you a child? Are you that easily influenced? And the the short answer is yes, you are, because you are a child. You're just, you might be over 18. You're just a big child then, I suppose. I'm just a big child. We're all just large children, aren't we, at some point? Super-sized children over the age of 18. But, um, oh, I've lost my train of thought thinking about, like, inflatable <laughs> people. But, um, yeah, ownership and responsibility. But at some point, you've got to stop blaming other stuff. Oh, my mum had bad genetics. When people say that, it might even be true. It's usually it's usually just a random story. It might even be true. Let's say your mother did have terrible genetics. Are you really going to let that be the reason why you don't try and take action on this? For goodness sakes. So you've got to take ownership and responsibility for yourself and stop blaming. Oh, so-and-so always brings snacks into the house. My flatmate's always got snacks. My, I always have bad food in my house for my kids. Stop that nonsense. You have to take the mantle for yourself and say, no, I'm doing this for me. I got to do this for me and no one else is coming to save me. No one else. And I say this to my clients. I say, look, you've paid to work with me and I am sincerely on your team. I actually genuinely care about you. I love what I do. I'm passionate about you. If you do badly as well, it reflects badly on me. I've got every incentive. Even if you paid up front, I've got every incentive to still help you and still give my all to you. But at the same time, you're in, you're in this alone. I'm not there when you're in the kitchen looking into your fridge like, mm, I want some ice cream. I'm not there. Okay. It's still only you. I can help. I can support. I can hold feet to the fire, but it's still you. And no one's going to come and save you with this stuff. You might find this video inspirational. I dare I say, uh, you might find it helpful. You might get some good strategy from it. This still is not going to be your breakthrough moment. It's going to involve you taking the information that I'm sharing and actually implementing it. That's where the magic happens. And if you're blaming other people all the time or you're waiting for someone to come and save you and help you and oh, just one day I'll have a personal trainer. None of, it's all an illusion. It's all an excuse to not try. Oh, that's enough on that. A couple of lifestyle things. Sleep, rest, really, really important. Sleep's so important. I talked about this recently on Instagram because of hormones, uh, because of mood. Uh, cravings then associated with um, change the chemicals in the brain. If you're sleep deprived, the chemicals in the, br the brain change hugely. One chemical, hormones are a type of chemical. That's an obvious one when it comes to cravings, but there are other things too. And so, yeah, it's going to be really hard or it's not impossible. You know, I've still had days where I haven't slept as well and that sort of thing. 
doesn't derail me, but I think the earlier on you are in your journey, you don't have quite so much control. So you really have to I talk about this idea of setting yourself up for success. It's not a profound idea. Other people have talked about this, but setting yourself up for success is getting enough sleep so that it's easier to make good food choices. When you're more advanced, it doesn't matter because you're so in the habit, you're so in the routine, you've got so much momentum and discipline on your side. It doesn't matter. You can be really tired and you still have a good choice. You can be on the go, really stressed, and you'll still make a good choice, but you build to that in time. When you're a beginner, set things up, manage the conditions in your life so that you have the best possible chance of success. Make sure you get enough sleep. Um, streamlining things, right? Don't be elaborate in the kitchen. Do a bit of batch cooking. You don't have to do like these, you see these YouTube videos, seven day meal prep. I never think this is necessitous, but a bit of batch cooking, you know, you're going to probably have a whole grain every day. So why not make enough brown rice or quinoa for three days? That's going to allow you to streamline your life to make overall cooking time much less at every meal. Again, setting yourself up for the best possible chance of success. That's it. Those are my five cornerstones of losing your first 20 to 50 pounds on a plant-based diet. The ultimate guide to get you started. My hope is, I didn't think we'd go on quite this long, almost an hour now. My hope is this wasn't too overwhelming. I fear there were moments where I was going on and on and maybe I did make it too overwhelming because I like the sound of my own voice. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. But certainly in terms of actionable steps to get you started, I hope you got something from this. So let me know down below uh, what you found most valuable here. And um, this is it. This is your blueprint. Start actioning right away. All the info that you need is here to get started. There's more advanced stuff, as I alluded to throughout, that I cover in other videos. And you should ought to, I would encourage you to think about in time. But everything I've shared today is everything you really need to get your first 20 to 50 pounds gone in the next couple of months here at the start of 2023. So go and make it happen. All the info here, but if you do want help putting it all together, you can head over to veganslimandsustain.com. The link will also be below, as always, veganslimandsustain.com, and learn more about how my clients are losing their first 15 to 25 pounds in 12 weeks with zero calorie counting, simple vegan meals, and no intense exercise. Okay, that's it from me. I don't think there are any questions in the chat. I may have missed some. It doesn't always appear so clearly here, but I've got to go for my next coaching call in 10 minutes or so anyway. So thank you very much for your time. See you soon.